coming up on this week's Salt and Sauce Chat Show. I, I, I've always had a particular delight for uh, politicians, for example. And I, I find that quite sad because as any that knows me will tell you, I'm, I'm the least politically minded person in Scotland. But politicians tend to be good, chatty. I find a lot of them to be quite self-deprecating, they can enjoy a wee laugh about themselves. I remember asking the professor, if you're sitting in the restaurant at five to six and they bring you your bill and there's an after eight minutes it, are you allowed to eat it? Right, it was all, all stupid stuff like that, right? But he enters into the spirit that he, he enjoys a laugh, you know? So basically, when I did my test um, at home, and it's just one of the episodes of life I get, but I'm so glad I did it. Um, did the thing where you send away your stool sample up to Nine Wells Hospital um, in Dundee, and I'm glad to say it's a self seal envelope they give you, because that was the bit that was putting me off having to lick the envelope, but it was fine. Welcome along to another episode of the Salt and Sauce Chat Show. I'm David Simmons. On this week's show, we're joined by a legend of the Scottish football scene. You'll have read his columns in the Daily Record, heard his voice on Off the Ball. We have after dinner speaker, host, restaurant reviewer, Mr. Tam Cowan on the show. Tam, thanks for taking the time out to come on, mate. Absolutely no problem. You missed out male model, though. You get the rest of the CV buying on. <laughs> no bother, mate. So you went to school in uh, Mullerwell, Braters High School. Uh, when you had your meetings with the, the careers advisor, was it always a, a road you were going to go down, the sort of media, radio, journalistic road? Uh, no, no, really. The, the, the chat was actually more with my English teacher. Um, I was, I was, I got heavily involved in, in writing bits and pieces at the, towards the, the end of my schooling. Uh, uh, first in Motherwell um, when I was in sixth year. And then uh, my English teacher, uh, Tom King, he had sent some stuff that I'd written along with one of my mates, guy who went on to be my best man at my wedding. And um, it was daft wee kind of sketches and stuff and topical jokes. And uh, he sent them into some programmes that were on Radio 4 and Radio 2. This was back in 1987. And uh, they used some stuff. And uh, this became a big deal at the school. Obviously, it was a classic kind of uh, good news story. Great one for the Motherwell Times. Me and my ended up on the front page of the paper. It had obviously been a very, very quiet week in Motherwell. But it, it gave us a, a, a great wee uh, boost. And then when I went to study journalism at Napier College, that's how long ago it was. It was still just a college. Um, I get more and more interested in the writing, whereas my pal, who was uh, studying geography, at, uh, at Glasgow, he kind of fell away for it a wee bit, but I persevered and um, get involved in writing for quite a few things at the BBC in Glasgow. Uh, Phil Duffer, who uh, was basically my mentor, the guy who uh, created Only an Excuse, um, he'd been producing uh, Naked Radio at the time, which then became Naked Video. So there was two sketch shows, one on radio, one on telly, um, that gave you a lot of scope for sending in your stuff. And then you also, of course, at the same time with Scotch and Rye, with dear old Ricky Fulton, it was still on the go. So I was able to get a wee stab at that as well. And then having dabbled in that for a couple of years, we, we need, you know, it wasn't as if I was making any money or anything like that. It was still merely a hobby and I, I, I didn't have two pennies to rub together. But, but courtesy of getting involved in that and indeed, of course, only an excuse when it was still uh, in the audio tapes and on Radio Scotland, um, when you put all those things together, I then managed to get a wee break in the Evening Times, uh, the Glasgow Evening Times, around about 1990-91, and uh, that started my newspaper career. Uh, I was reading the Times right through to 98, by which time we had started off the ball, 1994. So between having a wee different kind of platform, different uh, media platform between the radio and the newspapers. Uh, 98, I get kind of my big move to the Daily Record where I spent 16 years. I'm back at them now. I'll tell you more about that uh, later yeah. on. Uh, and then between the, the radio, the newspaper, uh, at, and both of them being national, then 98, run about 98, the first chance to really get my 200 days and telly stuff. So it all stems from 
uh, basically going to the creative writing classes in sixth year at high school. And the great encouragement uh, that I got from my English teacher. Yeah, I mean, you touched on how you got your break in the evening times there, predominantly a, a Glasgow newspaper. How does a, a Motherwell fan go into a job like that and sort of tear away at sort of Celtic and Rangers? It, it worked a treat. I think that is why it worked. I've got a lot to credit uh, the evening times for in terms of the rest of my career because uh, I went in there and I had a Motherwell fan and uh, the Glasgow evening times and when you're going back, you know, about 30 years uh, 30 plus years since I joined, like all print newspapers, uh, they had a really, really thriving uh, circulation. The Glasgow Evening Times was selling way in excess of maybe 150, 170,000 copies a day, uh, which is a lot. And primarily because it was the Glasgow um, Evening Times, uh, the, in terms of the football coverage, Celtic and Rangers were, were always the big players, you know, and there was, you know, honorary mentions almost for. Uh, the clubs kind of stretching out to Glasgow, Motherwell, Hamilton, St Mirren, uh, clubs like that. But I knew uh, my audience would be primarily Celtic and Rangers fans. Um, and that's precisely what I aimed at. It was great as a Motherwell fan. If Celtic had been in the doldrums, you could take the piss out of Celtic. Uh, and if it was Rangers that were having a tough time yet, you took the out of Rangers. So as a Motherwell fan, it, it, it was great. I, I, I don't think it could have worked if I had been a Celtic or a Rangers fan, simple as that. So I feel like it was the perfect platform because I was always going to be neutral. I was only ever just looking for what the joke was. Yeah. I mean, like you said, you touched on how you, you moved into radio as well with your colleague Stuart Cosgrove. Off the ball's been running since 1994 on BBC Radio Scotland. How did how did you and Stuart first sort of collide together and meet and form that partnership that we hear and love today? Well, it, it, it's people always, are always slightly astonished with us. Me and Stuart basically met uh, for the first time on morning of our first programme together. I had been doing Off the Ball for about a year. The show was formed in 1994. And it was a very, very different animal. Um, it was only half an hour. Once a week, half an hour, kind of after the football on a Saturday between half past five and six. And um, Greg Kempel uh, was the host. Uh, Sanji Coley was my fellow uh, panellist, if you like. I don't know what ever happened to they two guys. I hear they're struggling. Uh, and, and I was number three. Uh, and um, and basically, it had been put together, this programme, by our then producer, uh, a wee guy called Alan Depalette. And he only knew about me, as I said, by that time through the Evening Times. Uh, 1994, I'd still been working at the Evening Times. So almost right after the 94 World Cup um, in America, uh, we put together this show called Off the Ball. Half an hour on a Saturday night, Greg, Sanjeev, myself, and another nice fella, a guy called Ian Ross, who was a kind of roving reporter. And it made a bit of an impact because it was something really quite different. It was something quite in your face, particularly for Radio Scotland, uh, which even at that time, 1994, you still, some folks still had the image of the broadcasters and BBC Radio Scotland, Dana and Dickie Bowes, and the microphone with BBC written on it coming out the sky and all that. It all seemed a wee bit old fashioned. So we kind of went in and rumbled it up a wee bit, and it did get an impact. It wasn't it was necessarily a, a, a program or anything like that, but it did impact because it was something a bit different. And we were trying to buy in to the fact that 94, pre-internet as well, remember, Google was still four years away. So we were trying to tap into the, the kind of fanzine, the print edition fanzines, what had become really popular um, in Scottish football. Um, and we were trying to get into that kind of market, into that sort of audience. But after a year, and we did enjoy it, it was a great grounding uh, for all of us. Um, after a year, they were keep the programme going in some shape or form, but they didn't think the format we had was just right. And Greg and Sanjeev, with their own admission, they were only, you know, they were only, they'd have a keen interest shall we say, a mild interest in Scottish football, but I was certainly the only, the only guy with a season ticket in my back pocket uh, when we were in doing the shows. So they thought, right, we'll, 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 we'll give them a wee chance with whatever the, the format is that we start back with the following season. And they put a bit of work on it behind the scenes. Uh, Stuart Cosgrove was brought in. He'd always been a very, very keen vocal football fan. 
he had written by that stage a brilliant book, Hamden in Babylon, uh, about the more kind of colourful tabloid side of Scottish football down through the years. And me and Stuart were basically chucked together. I knew Stuart through his book. I knew Stuart for popping up and kind of arty farty programmes like the Late Show on BBC Two, uh, uh, speaking in his kind of very posh Radio Four voice and wearing his sunglasses indoors and all that. And Stuart uh, only knew of me when he came back up from London. Uh, he's telling me what he'd maybe pick up an evening things on a Monday night at the airport. And he, he, he always says that he, he enjoyed my column because it was about football, it was just a laugh. And the show always said it had punchlines, so isn't it just some kind of humbling stuff? So we had this kind of mutual respect for each other, I suppose. But bizarrely, we, we didn't meet until that first morning. That would be a, a Saturday morning, August 1995, just around about the start of the football season. And the idea was, um, I by no stretch was meant to be, you know, part of a diet and me going to be there uh, every week. Uh, they were kind of going at, at an expression that me and Stuart both you know, was meant to be the host and then I think a rotating panel of guests in with Stuart. I was in first, probably only as a common courtesy because I'd been part and parcel of the show for the previous season. And I think the idea was, right, we'll give Tam first try, first guest with Stuart, and we'll see where we go from there. But thankfully, um, me and Stuart kind of clicked a wee bit and, and, and we sat and didn't discuss that some years later. And I thought it was, as much as folks has been poles apart, um, I mean, for the early days, Stuart, uh, described us, and I think we put it in the back of a book of just the fourth or something. Stuart described us as um, the coarse lump of Lanarkshire land. That'd be me, of course. And Stuart uh, billed himself as the posh perch of poof. Uh, I'll remind <laughs> us that that particular expression that Stuart was using was 25 years ago. If he used that P word now, quite rightly, he'd be, he'd be kicked out the front door of the BBC. But as much as we might have seen totally, totally different characters, what, what we found really interesting was the bond we had between us. We were both kind of brought up in, in, in council schemes, Stuart and Perth. Me and neither of our families had a spare note at the end of another hard week. Um, and of course, we both, this is the crucial thing, we both supported what we like to call provincial teams, what we like to call diddy teams. So we had that wee immediate bond between the two of us, and we could look at the big boys with a kind of joint scant disregard uh, for the likes of the Celtics and Rangers of this world. So I think I think that worked, and, and lo and behold, uh, I must I always do credit Stuart with this and, and uh, thank Stuart for this. Um, but after that first week, when I guess I was going to be put back in the list and I'd maybe come back three, four weeks later. Sure, actually said to the producer, you know, hang hang on a minute here. I think me and Tam maybe had something there. Um, there was maybe a wee bit of chemistry. Why don't we bring Tam in, Tam in next week again? And then that was us. Uh, we were kind of joined uh, at the hat. Uh, hi, well, the Stuart, Stuart was right about the chemistry, Tam, wasn't he? Because... You've obviously lasted the test of time with the show being on air over 25 years. Um, I mean, is there any standout guests you've had? And you always have guests on the show. Is there any ones that you've had in that you thought, Ken, what well, they, they were really good? They were good guests. Oh, I can't. Anybody I, 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 that adds to the show, anybody brings something to the park. First and foremost, I must be honest with you, just somebody comes in and sits and talks away. The no idea, I think, of a, a so called bad guest on a radio program. And somebody that clums up and maybe gets very nervous. Um, but you know, I, I, I've always had a particular like for uh, politicians, for example, and I, I find that quite bizarre because as anybody that knows me will tell you, I'm, I'm the least politically minded person in Scotland. But politicians tend to be good, chatty folk. I find a lot of them to be quite self deprecating, they can enjoy a wee laugh about themselves. And whether it's been George Galloway or um, uh, we've had Nicholas Sturgeon in, we've had Alex Salmon down, uh, we had Lord Mike Watson, but we've, we've had loads and loads and loads of them in the show. Um, I just find that they've always been good. And because they are politicians, 
it's great in taking a pass out them a wee bit because that's what the audience expects. Uh, they're really willing you on to to try to bring them down a wee bit. But the flip side of that, in terms of great guests, I mean, two most memorable guests, two weeks ago, one a few years ago, were the Crankies. The Crankies were just absolutely brilliant. I'd, I'd obviously watched them all the time growing up as a kid. I still up a couple of years ago when they effectively retired. I went to see them in a pantomime of the year. And then here they were on my radio show. And, you know, whether folk love or hate the Crankies, they can't really deny they're absolutely legendary. Like Everybody knows who the Crankies are. And what was great, I always, always pay tribute to them for this. Even though neither of um, Ian or his wife Jeanette, either, even though neither of them was a football fan and such, they brought in a big book, huge big book, of all their routines that they had done, done through the years on stage, on telly and that. And it was all kind of an alphabetical order. And they come into the football section. And they had all these wee routines that they did with each other about Fatma, about wee Jimmy playing Fatma, but they go going to maybe see a Scotland game. And they basically had jokes. And that's what I like. They, they jokes into the studio that day. They were really, really professional. Um, they, they thought, right, we're going to this show. It's got a big audience. Let's do it properly. And, and that's exactly what they did. I think Stuart was a wee bit out of sorts, so it wasn't a, I don't think Stuart had watched them growing up. I don't think Stuart had seen them in part of mine, you know. But <laughs> there we go. I mean, personally, um, the, the show has been part of my weekend for years. I mean, I, I, I played football at various different levels. When I was travelling the game, I listened to the first instalment between 12 o'clock and 2. And then on your way home, you would get the end open all mics and then the second instalment at half past five. W was that always a thought when you were like developing the show going forward that you would catch the punters going into the game for the three o'clock kickoff and then you would get them coming home after the results had come through? I think, yeah, I think when we were doing two shows, and uh, then the before and after, I mean, originally, when it was me and Stuart, 1995, it was slightly different brand, if you like, because the pre-show was called On The Ball. I mean, I've still mm. got some really old T-shirts upstairs somewhere, and the branding was very much On The Ball, and that was meant to uh, separate the pre-show for the post-match show, which then was like a phone-in. Uh, you know, but uh, the two of them eventually just became known as Off the Ball as we, for different reasons, tended, the second show tended to get moved about the schedules for a wee while because way back when, uh, Santa, when they, they started showing games on a Saturday night um, at half past five, so the BBC were wanting one frequency in the radio to do the commentary of the live game, another frequency because as a public service broadcaster, Maybe for Tita Flow or whatever, a wee bit of Scottish uh, country dance music or whatever, and that was absolutely fine. So, for a while, we, our second show, I think it was on a Wednesday night, for a while, which was fine because they, there was available all some sort of football games the night, we'd go in after it. I think we'd been on a Tuesday night for a while. Uh, we then, some years later, went into a, a kind of a Sunday morning stroke lunch slot, and we basically preceded. Uh, the football, the football program, sports, and the county two, we'd maybe be on between 12 and 1, then hand to those guys. They were on at noon, we might have been on between 10 and 11. It was strange, but it's kind of settled down now um, in such a way that um, they, they were quite keen for us to have a Sunday show ever since the start of the pandemic. So they moved the Saturday night show uh, to the Sunday. And then that only recently, it was always on between 12 and 2. That was recently moved uh, just last week, in fact, was our first one to uh, 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And the idea was that people are tuning in for the football, pay frequencies. A lot of games are coming up at 12 noon. So you'll get a live game if you have a live game between 12 and 2. And then we're on between 2 and 4. And then it's back to sports in between four and five for a look back and a round up of uh, everything that had happened that day. So it's fair to say we've been moved about the schedules, but the, certainly the lunchtime show, maybe a flagship show, um, that's always kind of for a long, long time now been set in stone between 12 o'clock and two. 
Yep. I mean, you mentioned the pandemic there. During the pandemic that we've been going through, a regular guest you've had on the show has been Professor Jason Leach. I mean, he's quite a good addition to the show. I quite like what he's got to say. And for people that maybe work nine till five and miss the, the Nicola Sturgeon announcements daily, then it's a, it's a good catch up. How's, how's having him on the show? Well, you know what? Professor Jason Leach has been brilliant for a start to give up his time. I mean, him and so many of his colleagues are incredibly busy, and they have been since last March. Um, and Professor Jason Leach, in a strange way, is only as good on our show as the listeners make them, because uh, it's their questions that we put to Me and Stuart always have a wee bit of fun here for the first five or ten minutes. Uh, whether that's asking us recently when you're all down restaurants until six o'clock at night, I remember asking the professor if you're sitting in the restaurant at five to six and they bring you your bill and there's an after eight minutes, are you allowed to eat it? Right, it was all, all stupid stuff like that, right? But he enters into the spirit of that. He, he enjoys a laugh, you know. But we've had a lot of folk who have been watching the daily briefing when they were surgeon. It's the, the press guys, the media asking all the questions. And we thought there must be so many people at home who watch um, the professor with Nicola Sturgeon maybe every day, Monday day, and they've got their own questions. So so we gave them that platform and off the ball. They got a real wide range of questions. And absolutely brilliant. We can do four hours on it easily every Saturday. But in general terms, it'll be the same again. Uh, this Saturday coming, uh, he'll be on the past 12 and 1 o'clock. And uh, um, that, that, that's been a good slot for him. We have a wee bit of fun at the start. And then we go over to the, the listeners. And the only downside of it, quite frankly, you, you know what it's like. You get a lot of folk casting aspersions about our political beliefs and that just because we've got Jason Leake John. And at the moment, he is working for the SNP. I mean, Jason Leach, I always like to remind folk, if it was the Tories that were in power, Labour, if it was Lord Raving Looney Such, whatever you called that old character, if he was in power, it would actually still be Jason as a civil servant who would be doing all the stuff that he does. So it's no, it's no political, you know. And I, I kind of be asked me all that anyway. But So it's just been really good. But in terms of how things have moved on, what's really, really weird, we actually... In the first week that he was in, in March 2020, that was the one and only time we were able to have him as a guest in the studio, live in the studio. And he came in that first day, before we, just before we went on air, he shook me and Stuart by the hand, and you now think back, wow, a handshake from Scotland's National Clinical Director, you know, it was really weird. And when we started the programme that day, folk were already aware of Maybe you shouldn't be shaking hands with people. And mm. we asked him, it was the very first thing we asked him in the programme, Jason, you shook your hands in, you came into the studio. I thought we're not meant to do that. And he said, March 2020, he said, he said, you know, I made a judgment. Um, he said, uh, 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 I see you've got a gel in the studio, you've got the clinical wipes. He said, I made a judgment call that you and Stuart, your hands were clean. Mine are certainly clean with shirt cans. And then we went on to ask him, it seems bizarre now, we went on to ask him about you know, hospitality, eating, drinking, pubs, restaurants. And that very night, uh, he boldly told us he was going out for a curry. We went, he was going to the Mother India in Glasgow, uh, just up by the Kelvin Hall. And he said, yeah, he says, before we begin, we'll clean our hands after a floor. I've got a gel in my hands, we'll sit and have a meal. Uh, and then as we leave to get the taxi, we'll clean our hands again. And that was it. But one week later, it was as if everything, the world caved in and uh, everything really accelerated. And one week later, Jason was very much a guest who we could only have down the line. And he immediately was saying, well, that's it. That's the shaking hands stopped. That's the going out into restaurants stopped, blah, 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 blah. And it just shows you how quickly things uh, can change but he's been an absolute brilliant guest and I must say I'm not, I'm not telling tales out of school but there has been the odd wee serious point that people have got in touch with me about be it via the radio via the paper via my social media and 
you know, when it when it seemed quite a, an important issue to the person who'd sent it to me, a, a very gingerly, originally, Passamonte professor leaked, thinking I shouldn't be doing this. He's a busy, busy man. This is this is me taking liberties now. But he very, very graciously gave me not only a response, but a very, very prompt response that I was able to send on to uh, the people who had asked the questions. And this, this, a lot of the time, was very, very serious stuff, maybe to do with the health of a member of the family or whatever. Um, so good on him. I, I wouldn't hear a bad word uh, against him. That's definitely, absolutely. Of course. <laughs> Well, that's what we're going to talk about, because as we know, you're a Lanarkshire man, you've uh, followed Motherwell all your days. I mean, your schedule on a Saturday must be quite busy if Motherwell are playing at home. Do you just hop foot from the BBC studios right over to Fur Park? Uh, this is, I mean, this is a, I've, I've been asked this a hundred times, but it's amazing how guys like yourself are always very, very interested in it. And, and for listeners or viewers or whatever, they, they always seem fascinated by that. It's just as my routine. And a normal Saturday, obviously talking pre-COVID here, uh, but normally I would uh, we would finish the first show at two o'clock, and then basically if mother are at home, um, I can uh, sprint out the BBC and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have driven across to Fur Park uh, by I don't know, and a good day I can get there about twenty-five to three, um, hopefully at the very latest. If there'd been any traffic or whatever, any holdups, uh, as long as I'm there in time for kickoff, I'm quite happy. And the, I must be honest, I, I like to uh, disclose these sort of things. The only thing that I've ever asked Motherwell for down through the years, I mean, a day all Motherwell's events for them, the the player of the year stuff, the Hall of Fame gigs, the Q and A's with the manager, and that, and it's a joy. I would never ever ask Motherwell for money for doing it, and they're always they sometimes get a wee bit. Irritated when I don't, they think I mean, a job I should be invoicing them, but I couldn't bring myself to do that. Uh, uh, so, the one thing that I did ask them for fairly recently, uh, one of the members of the board left the club. I used to, as I came over to Far Park and drove by the main stand to get into the old school car park, I noticed that ever since a board member had left, parked right outside the main stand, that there was a wee uh, car parking space available, so I very, I very quietly and very politely asked um, Alan Burrows, our chief executive, and uh, Suzanne, our head of commercial, if there was any chance just to make my life a bit easier on a Saturday, uh, mainly to make sure that I could get a, a quick getaway after the game because when my car was parked elsewhere, I maybe had to leave ten minutes early just to get out of the game. Sharpish, get into my car and then beat the traffic um, out of Mother Old on the M74 because if you get caught in any of that, I would never have made it back for the show. So thankfully, they were only too happy uh, to give me that wee parking space. So I'm quite proud of the fact, genuinely, that I, I do have my own parking space at Mother Old, uh, but it's for purely practical purposes, um, I hasten to add. But, but that's what happens, and then I get back in time. As I say, it's not an issue now. They've moved the second show uh, to the Sunday, uh, but that that helps me in terms of getting over to Fur Park in time for kickoff. And as far as it goes, we're away games. Um, I can, of course, I could probably get to Hamilton, St. Mullen Rangers, and Celtic. But to be honest with you, with that, it's a lot easier. When I don't certainly have those parking privileges, um, it's a lot easier for me to watch those games coming into the building which I'm also very, very privileged to be able to do. You can sit and watch any game you want coming into the building before they kind of edit them and stuff for sports at night. So I'll, I'll, I'll sit and kind of watch the games uh, coming into the BBC. Stuart uh, is the guy I feel a wee bit sorry for if I flip it onto him because Stuart's club, St Johnston, of course, based in their home game are out the way on a Saturday he could bomb up. He, he, he made a couple of exceptions. He, he, he won his pals, pick him up, bang on two o'clock at the BBC when it had been a big, big game in Perth. And Stuart told me by the time they bombed it up to Perth, into the ground and stuff, they maybe missed the first 15, 20 minutes, you know. But he always said it was worth it because it was a big game. But as things stand just now, Stuart uh, will make a point with some of his fellow St. Johnston fans. Perth been out of reach. 
He'll finish at two o'clock. And if St Johnston are at Celtic, Rangers, Motherwell, St Marin, Hamilton, and Apush Kilmarnock, then Stuart will absolutely get a ticket for those games so that he can go and watch his team. Superb, superb. I mean, I take it pre-COVID, like we said, I mean, you do a lot of after-dinner speaking, like what you said that you do at Fur Park for Motherwell. I mean, your Saturdays just must have been a write-off, just fully with work. I mean, how is it now not being able to do those sort of live events, those after-dinner speaking events that you normally do? Well, that, I mean, I'm joking to you earlier about sitting here in my goonie, uh doing this. It's, it's not my choice. As, as of about a year ago, I could sell all my clothes. Uh, on eBay just to get some money. It's been oh, it's been terrible. It's been it's been grim. I mean, basically, I could between events like award ceremonies or stuff like that. Uh, of course, after stuff, even when I did my own kind of show that I've done in years gone by in theaters and stuff, um, all of that just get wiped out. And uh, as of March, and uh, I, I could maybe book Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. Sunday afternoon, so I really don't miss that, but I, I don't complain because I'm, I'm one of the lucky people because of the radio, um, and I do some stuff with Peter Martin, my pal Peter for PLZ Soccer, um, I've done some stuff with him for the past year and a half, I kept that going via the, the wonders of modern technology, so I've still been doing that, and I've still been doing, um, I get back Recently, from about a there, started back with the Daily Record. So I've got a couple of pages to write for them now every week. I do that on my Monday, Tuesday. Uh, I've also been doing a, a food podcast, which was to place me when I stopped doing restaurant reviews in 2019. Uh, that was almost a direct return to BBC. were keen for me to do something on food, not to away two decades of experience as a restaurant reviewer. So we've been working on those as well. So I'm, I'm absolutely not complaining. Um, there's been a lot of pals in mine. Um, I, I, I've got a pal who uh, has always been involved in the classic uh, show business. Like he's, he's, he's always been involved, uh, involved as a performer. He's, he, in recent years, he's been a really, really big pantomime star in Glasgow. And he basically hasn't had any luck since last March. It's been absolutely heartbreaking. And his wife is actually a dancer uh, who is within a group of dancers who do the shows on stage and do the pantos, and she hasn't been able to work as well. So stories are absolutely tragic. So I, I absolutely count my blessings. Um, yeah. And I'm really, really happy with, with what I've got. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a good way to look at it, Tam. I mean, we have to talk about the TV show Offside that you done. It all kicked off in 1998. It ran for nine years in total. Uh, what are your memories of doing the show? I remember. Let's hand over to Jock the Cock. <laughs> oh, the cock. Um, sadly, I think COVID's bad, but uh, bird flu got him uh, <laughs> a few years ago. So that was that was sad. But it was I mean, a lovely funeral for that. But no, also, again, I was saying it's a bit strange uh, kind of path I had to, to what, I, what I'm actually doing now. Um, because of the success of the uh, radio show, I did three, four years in the radio under my belt when they were looking to give kind of new talent a wee, a wee chance in TV. Uh, going back to 19, uh, 1998, there was a station called BBC Choice Scotland, available almost, if you like, it's satellite channel. There was BBC Choice Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. A couple of years later, the four of them kind of disbanded or were merged, and they became BBC Three and BBC Four. And it regionalised um, the commissioning editor at the time, Ewan Angus, who still just a pal of mine, and he gave me a wee start doing this thing called Offside, but it's just a, 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 a telly version, a piss take of Scottish football, a wee version of off the ball, if you like, on the telly. It was uh, the first two years that we did it. Um, we did one every week. It was it was, it was quite full on. Uh, it was just in the wee Studio B at the old BBC, Queen Margaret Drive. And it was basically me and two guests, invariably a journalist 
and someday a kind of well kent face, whether it was somebody like Fish, uh, Derek Dick, a million, uh, sitting next to a journalist, football journalist like Jim Spencer, whoever it may have been. But it was only the three years in this wee broom cupboard of a studio. Uh, there, there was no studio audience, there was no budget, it was all done very, very cheap. But they liked it and they thought it, it really worked. Uh, I wrote with my writing partner, Rob Christie, the two of us wrote every script for the nine years that we did the programme. We put a hell of a lot of work in there. It was packed out with jokes and stuff. And um, lo and behold, then when BBC uh, Choice Scotland was going to come to an end, they gave us a wee crack at BC One on a Monday night, 10.35, and uh, we had a very, very happy seven or eight years of the show being on proper telly, if you like. It was great. I still have very, very fond memories. And, and indeed, that's why we speak here. Now. It was only this morning somebody had sent me a wee clip of when Alice was on the programme many moons ago, and I just put it up in my social media and Instagram and what a reaction it got. It was incredible, folk. Oh, Tom, you need to bring that show back. Oh, Tom, you need to at least repeat it. Oh, Tam, Yeah, ab- absolutely. YouTube and all that, you know. And it was just a very warm... Uh, it, was a, it, was just, it was a very warm, happy uh, time in my life because I love doing the show. I love meeting a lot of people I want really to meet. Everybody from Tony Christie, Kevin Keegan, Joe Jordan... The Preclars, uh, James McAvoy, uh, also awful, you know, this tapestry of guests, John Higgins, the world snooker champ. Uh, we had him on like, a day after he'd won the world snooker one year down in Sheffield. It was brilliant. He was, he was steaming when he was actually in the programme. Him and his brothers <laughs> had come in, and quite rightly so. We just kept talking a lot. We said, you're a, you're a world champion. You dig in, have all you want. Um, but it was brilliant. Um, and do, do, do you think we will see it return back to the screen, Stam? Sorry. Uh, after, I, I don't think so. It was probably it was probably deemed a, a quite an expensive program in its day. And I know maybe critics would have looked at it and thought, "Oh, what's this bloody rubbish? This fucking knockabout shite for this guy, Tam Cow and Scottish footman." But it actually was an expensive program. To put on any program with a studio audience is naturally expensive, even with the costs that that's and extra staff, etc. Um, and because it's on BBC One, um, then uh, you've got to push the boat out a wee bit when it comes to guests uh, and get maybe even a better quality of guests. And you maybe then get guests who have to stay overnight, they put up in a hotel, you guess that maybe have to be flown in, and they expect. Expenses uh, really, really spiral. So um, I would find it unlikely that it would come back in that shape or form. I wonder how I would find the time now, to be honest with you, because see, when I think back, I mean, when we started doing uh, Offside in 1998, that was still, what would that have been? And that would have been uh, seven years before I got married in 2005 and had a family, et cetera. Um, so it was maybe, shall I say, a lot easier to do then when you were footloose and fancy free. And you were also, remember, as well as doing a, a telly show every week, I had two radio shows to do, and I had three uh, newspaper columns to write, including a restaurant review, which meant I had to be anywhere, I could anywhere right around Scotland. So it was some bloody workload. Um, I, the, the thought it now gives me the fear. Um, but I, I really, really enjoyed it. And the, the Monday nights, after we'd called the show, um, we, we, we did it as live. It was always the best way to do it in terms of keeping it really, really topical. We would start the recording maybe about half seven, quarter eight on Monday night, going out in front of the studio audience at the start and having a real over-the-top, ex-artistic stuff you couldn't hear on the show, laugh with the audience at the start. I think they enjoyed that as well. But then once we started, it was done as live. And only if a camera broke in or a studio lights crashed uh, or somebody said the C word, uh, which you would never ever be allowed, even though we had a long leash, that's the only reason that they would stop the recording. We would bash right through it. And then that would give them 
no more than two hours to make the odd wee nap in the edit sweep before it went on the telly at half past 10, 10 35 at night. And see, when we finish the programme, oh boy, oh boy, if we finished them, we knew, right, we got a good show there, the guests were great, the audience were up for a cup. We would then retire, run about half past eight to the green room, and that's where you'd sit with the guests, have a drink, have a laugh, have a carry on, before, invariably, I don't know if you remember this place, it's no, it's no longer there, it's now a, a, a wee Indian restaurant, but just next to Hullhead on the station on Byers Road, we always decanted around about nine, ten o'clock, didn't we? A wee pub called Bonhams that was there at the time. And they always loved uh, to us. Uh, we eventually got a wee lock in because they always knew that we would bring down uh, a guest, uh, whereas and they would get 40s and all that, and it was good for the past. So we would turn up the, you know, the proclaimers, uh, uh, Kelly Douglas, Kenny Douglas's daughter. We were in one night with Paolo Natini. Um, it was great. So Monday night was was the social night of the week. It was brilliant. Yeah, I mean, but we've touched on as well how you're a massive Motherwell fan, Tam. Um, things aren't going so great in the in the league table this season, mate. You're sitting near the bottom. I think you're in ninth place as we stand at the moment. Um, do you think your new gaffer, Graham Alexander, is the right man to turn that around for you? Aye, well, we're on the way up. Um, we've shown definite things of improvement. I was a big fan of Stevie Robinson. Uh, cards in the table. I still wish Stevie uh, Robinson was there. Uh, and I had a lot of time for the guy. I thought he was a real, real workaholic. Maybe that's maybe that's what let him down in the end. Maybe he was so intense that when the results weren't happening, latterly he thought, right, I just need to walk away from this, which is precisely what he did. Um, but I've got a lot of time for the guy. He was a great man as well, and I always like going on record with this, the saying that whenever all the fan events that I did, Stevie was always great at helping out and turning up. You can go to some clubs, and when it comes to their supporters' nights, they send along reserve team players and guys like that you've never heard of. Stephen Robinson was always front of the queue if you were needing help with doing a Q&A. Uh, in a pub in Motherwell or at the club itself or whatever so I, I, I've got a, a lot of time uh, Stephen Robinson it's thank him that for the first time ever I saw my club in the two major cup finals in the one season I'd never seen that before albeit in both of them we hosted by Celtic but we still go there a bit so yeah I would salute Stephen Robinson but Graham Alexander uh, kind of excites me. The guy's got 40 international caps. His name's me Mung. And I think, crucially, he'd, he'd mainly dabbled uh, managerially in the, in the kind of lower reaches of English football. And the bottom line is, that is now our market for players at Marble. So I'm hoping that bit of expertise that he's got at that level uh, will maybe be a bonus uh, for Marble in terms of personnel. And he has got off to a good start. Um, I would even say that most notably in defeat uh, the Saturday before last when we lost 2-1 at Celtic even though everybody was saying that Celtic had been in a bad run they kind of had a wee bit of last couple of but um, you know it was still Celtic with players earning a lot more money per week than the entire Motherwell squad put together so we put on a right good show at Celtic Park the other week and we're very lucky not to snatch a draw at the death. So, yeah, I, I, I see a definite improvement under Graham Alexander. We get a, we get a really nice one against Colmarnock the other week, Tommy Wright's first game in charge for Kelly. And everybody always talks about the bounce when the new manager comes in. Well, we knocked that out of the park. We went down there and get the three points and to back up the road. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping it's upwards and onwards. I, I genuinely, in my heart of hearts, don't, it's always a dangerous thing for anybody in football to say, but I genuinely think we're too good to get down. Uh, if anybody ever says that to me about any other club, I remind them of Hibs a few years ago when Big Terry Butcher was in charge. And as they started dropping down one position up for another league that year, everybody kept saying, oh, they're too good to get down. They're too good to get down. And then lo and behold, last kick of the ball against Hamilton Ackies in the second leg of the playoff at Easter Road, you get out and were relegated. Uh, I need some smashing players in their team at the time. So I, I, I never ever say they're too good to get in. That's, that's dangerous. 
Yeah, absolutely. A bit of a serious question now, Tam, if you don't mind. In 2019, uh, there was an article in the Daily Record where you thanked your wife uh, for making you go for a bowel cancer test. Now, I think you've done a, a video on social media as well, like you said on your Instagram, um, where it said this little test could help save your life. Uh, obviously, us guys, we've got this thing about us where I will do it later or I but stop going on about it. We'll get around to it. I mean, how important is it for, for guys to maybe take that test? Oh, absolutely. I mean, everybody loves it. Uh, it's great that in the media, in the newspapers, radio or telly, everybody's positively encouraged to come out and talk about things like that. It wasn't always the case. I mean, I had done it 20 odd years ago and off the ball when I, I basically found a lump on my testicle uh, when I was in the bath one night. And it was at a time I had a huge nationwide campaign about testicular cancer and getting yourself checked and all that. And I was very, very lucky. Um, it turned out a word that I'll never forget. It turned out it was a hydrocele, uh, which is basically a, a, a very a harmless cyst just filled with nothing uh, more serious than water. But it, after getting a real, real fright, I remember bringing it uh, on off the ball. I just put it out there to our audience and reminding uh, the, the guys that were tuned in uh, to check uh, yourself and if you think you've got any issue to go. Uh, to the hospital right away. Uh, don't waste any time. That's what can actually kill you. And it's much the same with the bowel. Uh, basically, I got a test when I was 50. It's an absolutely brilliant thing. Incredibly look out there, 50 plus. I spoke to Big Alan Ruff, and I don't mind naming him and shaming him here. After I had my scare with the bowels, I said to Ruffy, he, he, he'd seen the story in the paper as well, and I said, I take it you get checked every two years, because after your initial check, they encourage you to come back every two years. And he just looked at me and shook his head. He says, no. Now, Alan Ross is 67. That's 17 years. He could have had something up with his bowel and he didn't go to get it checked. So basically, when I did my test um, at home, and it's just one of the episodes of life I get, but I'm so glad I did it. Um, did the thing where you send away your stool sample up to Nine Wells Hospital, um, in Dundee and I'm glad to say it's a self-seal envelope they give you because that was a bit that was putting me off having to lick the envelope but it was fine uh, but I sent it away and I thought there we go, that'll be fine and I, I can't remember it was a week maybe later I get a letter that came in I actually came in for Nine Wells on a Friday and my wife knew it was at the Nine Wells Hospital stamp on it so obviously being concerned she opened it and she didn't actually show me it until the Monday because she knew I had a very, very busy day. She knew that I'm very, very thin-skinned. Any of my pals will tell you that I'm a, I'm a real bag of nerves at the best time. So because she knew I had a lot of work on that weekend, she kept it uh, away from me to the Monday. And then we were sitting in the house on the Monday. And she says, come here, sit down and I'll get a cup of tea just to talk to you about something. So I wondered what it was. And then she pulled out this letter saying, um, I'd tested positive, there was uh, blood in my stool and I would have to uh, make an urgent appointment uh, through my doctor and get this checked out. Now, as you can imagine, when when you get a letter like that, your mind always thinks the worst case scenario. And the minute I read that, I thought, that's me, I've got cancer. Uh, so we wasted no time whatsoever. I had a, a endoscopy. I think it's called, uh, which showed that I did have polyps, P-O-L-Y-P-S. I had polyps forming uh, in my bowel. I then went for a colonoscopy uh, to get them uh, removed, kind of, I think, by laser. And thankfully, none of them had, if you like, to keep the terminology simple. But these polyps are exactly the things that can turn cancerous. Uh, they can become tumours and they can indeed kill you, as it did happen to my, my dearly departed mother-in-law who passed away in 2012. It was bowel cancer that got her. So the minute that um, I had this uh, operation and uh, got it all clear, huge, huge relief. But I made a point of uh, getting the message out there, originally on my social media, all the leaflets that I'd been sent by Nine Wells, I got them in a video. And as I knew what was going to happen next, there was various media outlets, including the BBC and the Daily Record, in touch 
I want to do a story on this in terms of the message out there as well. And then in, in terms of how modern media works, social media, before I knew it, uh, the British uh, bowel cancer screening unit had got in contact with me um, from London. And they actually, one, one of their representatives even came up uh, from London to meet me in Glasgow uh, with a view to me doing some sort of promotional stuff for them to help them out. So it was quite an escapade and a half. And it's slightly, I'm, I'm, I'm not alarmed by it, but because of COVID, it's so hard to get back into hospital. It's so hard to make normal appointments. After um, I had that scare, which thankfully was okay, in the kind of late summer of 2019, even though you're meant to then go back every two years, I was advised uh, by the specialist to come back the following year because he reckoned I could be what he called a polyp former. Uh, these things may be more prone to, to grow, to appear in my bowel than maybe other people. So he didn't want to take any chances. But simply, I was just actually talking about my wife the other night, simply because of COVID, uh, it was a non-starter getting back in last summer. So here we are in a new year. And basically the minute I think that, you know, people uh, who are ahead of me in the queue with some sort of medical treatments or procedures, then I will need to kind of chase that up again and uh, and and get myself back in for another appointment. But it was quite a it was quite a it was quite a dramatic uh, period in my life. I, I, I was absolutely overjoyed, of course, that it, it, it wasn't anything serious, and it felt absolutely brilliant for to get the message out there. I've heard the numerous radio shows, we had the newspaper stuff, I was able to get the message on my own radio show, and as you say, you saw the article, we got it out there in the national newspapers. But I just urge everybody again, even folk tuned into this, if you're 50, and I mean, they, they, they wait until they're 60 in England, it's a, it's a great thing in Scotland. You're able to get yourself checked from the age of 50. Please, 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 guys, tune down to this. Do it. It could save your life. Yeah, absolutely. Especially the climate we're in just now where people aren't maybe going out at the weekends, going out at nights during the week. Get this kit organised, get it delivered to your door and take it. And like you say, Tam, it could well save your life. Tam, just finally, you used to review restaurants. You've done that for 16 years. Like you say, you're not doing it so much now. But um, what, what sort of things would that involve? Would that involve you going to restaurants, sampling the, the, the food and reviewing it? Or would it be... Yeah, just talk us through that time in your life, those 16 years. Well, I did that actually for... It was 21 years, I actually did it. Right. Um, when, I, when I joined the Daily Record in 1998 from the Evening Times, it just coincidentally, the first day that I was scheduled to be in the paper, uh, Saturday in September 1998, it turns out they were launching the Daily Record magazine, which is still in the paper to this day on a Saturday. And the editor who'd signed me up uh, to write two columns a week also wanted me to do something in the magazine. So when I spoke to him about this, I said, right, I'm a firm believer in maybe try to, you know, um, uh, and if it's, I said, I'll do it if it's something that interests me. And he said, he said, but your interests, and I touched on this earlier, it was 1990, I was footless and fancy free, single man, still living in my mum's house in Motherwell, and the, oh, the joys of spring, it was incredible, you know, and I, you don't believe how lucky you were when you think back. Um, but because of that, I had a very, very active social life. I was out every night of the week, out eating, drinking every night of the week, with an assortment of pals, we were a young lady happened to enjoy my company at that particular time. It was great. And so I said to my editor, half jokingly, I said, well, I've got a really active social life, I guess that's my interest, you know. And he said, right, great. He said, uh, I want a restaurant review in the magazine and I want it to be exactly somebody like yourself, just like in the Joe Punter, somebody who goes into the restaurants, no snootily looking down your nose at them and no worrying about where the artichokes were sourced or how fresh uh, was the asparagus or anything like that. You know, just going out as a punter. So I, I said, great, count me in. And it was brilliant. I did it for the 16 years I was at a Daily Record. And the punters really, really bought into it. 
I mean, once upon a time, folk were out in the street a lot in a pub. They don't want to talk to me about the FATMA and primarily Motherwell or a wee dig about Motherwell or Shite, Tam or who ate all the pies, all that kind of stuff. But from 1998 onwards, folk were just fascinated with me going and visiting these restaurants every week. And you would get a lot of correspondence with folk then. They were saying, Tam, it's my wife's 30th birthday next week. We live in Dundee. Where do you think I should go? Uh, oh, Tam, it's my, my parents' 40th wedding anniversary. They live in Edinburgh or somewhere nice you can suggest. We did all that stuff. And it was brilliant. It was fantastic. It, 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 you see, maybe even parts of Scotland that I wouldn't go to. And my dining companion always get the best deal. Always get the best deal. Because latterly, the Daily Record then, when I get my kind of Mo Johnston move, for the Daily Record to the Scottish Sun, but for me to keep it going there as well. So I did it for another five years uh, at the Scottish Sun. And the best deal, as I say, always was invariably, well, I, well I've only been driving for 2012. I used to use the train and stuff. And I'd maybe meet up back in those days, meet up with a pal, uh, let's say, Glasgow Queen Street Station. And we'd just look at the board and I'd say, right, where have I not been for a while? Uh, Perth, Metros, Arbroath, Aberdeen, let's go there. We jumped in the, the train, we had a light somewhere around about lunchtime, and we just say to the local taxi rank that was always there at the train station, jump in a cab, say, mate, anywhere you recommend for a wee bite to eat, and they'd take you to a place. It was a brilliant day out, but as I say, the dining companion, one of my pals or whatever, always get the better deal, because they get fed and lard, they had a great day out. Didn't have to put their horn in their pocket. And then, of course, they didn't have to write up a 1,000, 1,200-word article. It was me that had to do that. So I'll say the, the, whoever was with me in a restaurant review definitely get the best end of the stick. But it was great, great fun. And as I say, when it stopped, when I left the Scottish Sun in the summer of 2019, it was just basically costs. Um, you know, the, the print journalism... It's been a bit of battering in recent years, just for obvious reasons. The technology that's not available at people's fingertips. So I was a, I was a casualty of twenty uh, first century life, if you like. I was I was a bit of an expensive luxury. Uh, so I kind of took my money and ran. And as I say, the the BBC then through the years had always chipped away at me a wee bit. Some producers that I know all saying, "Oh, you've never done in in the food front for the BBC." Anymore. So they've been talking. Talking talk today in a, a podcast which finally came to fruition uh, last autumn. Uh, it's called Scoff the Ball, uh, available by BBC Radio Scotland, available the usual outlets, BBC Sound, Spotify, iTunes, whatever. And basically the idea is it's just really telling a lot of the great stories about Scottish food, uh, Scottish food people. Uh, we, we, we record one gets published uh, every week on a Thursday. We've recorded quite a few of them. We've backed some of them up. And it was great fun. I uh, wanted to record about the first one, the last one, rather, of the first series. And the only, the only slightly thing that eats away at me a wee bit is that when these were first um, uh, put to me, the year before last, as an idea, the idea, of course, was that we would be travelling to these restaurants to meet some of the great people who put Scotland's wonderful produce on the plate. It would have been up to Oban, would have been going up to Inverness, would have been down to the Scottish borders. And the best example I can give you, we spoke um, to Robert Smith, who owns the famous Anstruther Fish Bar, arguably the most famous fish and chip shop in Scotland. But because of bloody COVID, we could only speak to him down the line. We meet in a radio studio at the BBC, and Robert sitting maybe in one of the tables at the front of his cafe in Anstruther. So it wasn't, he, it wasn't me in his shop seeing how he fries the fish and any secret ingredients he puts in the batter. And then, of course, the good bit sitting down there and having a blether while we're tucking into the fish and chips. So sadly, we couldn't do that. Uh, but we still had great fun doing the podcast. And I'm hoping that if they get recommissioned for another run, I'm hoping coronavirus will be ancient history and we're able to get out and about uh, uh, and really enjoy it to the full.
I mean, yeah, final question for you, Tam. Obviously, the, the COVID restrictions are in place at the moment. You can't travel anywhere. You can't go out for anything to eat. If I said to you, you've got a free pass tonight, you and the missus can travel anywhere in Scotland, you can eat at any restaurant, which one would you choose? Well, you know what? I would, I'm such a, I'm such a, a sentimental old sod as well. I would need to include my wee girl, uh, Sophie, who's uh, now 10 years old. And I would keep it local, even when it was to the I want to talk about buying into the uh, buy local, eat local hashtags uh, during the first lockdown. And we tried our best to do that as well. Uh, so I would either I'd leave it in my my wee girl in the final say, but it would either be we'd either go to Little Soho and Jordan Hill in Glasgow, or we'd get through the tunnel and we'd go to Bella Vita. Uh, my pal Mimo's Italian restaurant in the south side of Glasgow, just off Paisley Road West in Moss Park. We go to the two of them, as we have done uh, ever since we, we moved in the house that we're at now 11 years ago. We, we try to kind of uh, to patronise both of those places. Our pals own them and run them, and we love the two of them. So it would be me, the wife, and the Wayne. And because we hadn't been out in a restaurant for so long, I would even insist to my wife, it doesn't mind driving. It is definitely a taxi tonight. And in fact, <laughs> if I thought there was no COVID, and because it's been so long, even though my wee girl's only 10, uh, I would probably insist that she get bloated as well. Uh, <laughs> if, only to remind, if only to remind people that I'm a, a Lanarkshire boy at heart, <laughs> Absolutely superb. Tom, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tom Cowan. No problem. Good luck to you.